Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, Africans, depending on your time zone. I am by name Ngu August Nanicho, the director of AfriMega Industries. Today, we have a very important somebody coming up for this interview. He is no other person than the leader of OAF, One African Family Organization. He is by name Ezechi Mere Mozo. Today he is going to answer numerous questions which have been bothering Africans. You are welcome to this interview. We the Africans wish to know you more. Please, can you introduce yourself to us? Greetings to all Africans all over the world. It's a chimney also, it's my name. I got grits. I'm just two years old. I'm a graduate of the University of Nigeria, Osaka, where I obtained a BSc in economics. I also attended several leadership trainings when I was a student. For God's grace, I'm a poet. I am also an author. I've authored several books that pertain to the plight of the continent and the people of Africa, including The Wisdom and the Power of African Unity and 202 Questions and Answers about African Progress. And I've also authored several books which are yet to be published. Because of this, I'm a biogas engineer working on converting waste to wealth or waste to energy, which could be used for cooking, for running electricity, as in running generators to generate electricity to cool power homes and industries. Because of this, I'm the chairperson of OAF, and OAF stands for One Africa Family or the Organization of the African Family. OAF has the responsibility of ending poverty in Africa and an overall vision. Of leading Africans from last to first, that is from the poorest to the richest people in the world, from the weakest to the most powerful people in the world. And we intend to achieve this through seven missions. These seven missions are seven objectives which OF must achieve in order to achieve the overall vision of OF, including one standard leadership, two African unity, three justice and peace, four academic or total education, five, environmental excellence, good health. We intend to achieve all these objectives in order to achieve the African vision. So this is who I am and this is who we are. Thank you very much. Wow. That is a whole lot of autobiography. <laughs> okay, without wasting time, the next question I have here is, can you tell us how slave trade began? Because many people have given many dates and most of them happen to be wrong. Please, can you just let us know when exactly and how the slave trade began? The most important part, how did it begin? Okay, the slave trade began in the year 1441. Two Portuguese captains began the slave trade by name Anto Gonçalves and Nutristal. They captured 12 Africans in the west coast of Africa at Cape Branco in Mauritania and took them as slaves, sold them as slaves in Lisbon, Portugal. In the year 1444, another Portuguese captain by the name Lanzaro de Freitas came to the west coast, west coast of Africa again in the Bay of Alguin in Mauritania again, took about 205 Africans as slaves and sold them in his hometown of Lagos in uh, Portugal. That was how the slave trade began. They continued to make slave raids and trades. The Portuguese began to set up slave forts in the west coast of Africa, for example, the Elmina Castle in modern day Ghana. And they began to build slave plantations across the coast, west coast of Africa and some in Portugal. And they continued to take Africans as slaves. Eventually, Portuguese slave traders set up their ports at this uh, Seville in Spain and began to recruit Spanish traders into the slave trade. Eventually, from the year 1470s, the, the Spanish traders began to make entry into the transatlantic slave trade and they continued to make this trade until the year 1492. The year 1492 was a very significant year in the history of the world and also in this transatlantic slave trade. From that year, on the 12th of October 1492, Christopher Columbus became the first European confirmed to have stepped his foot on the Americas. As he stepped his foot on the Americas, Europeans then began to move into the Americas and began to take large swaths of continental lands for themselves. 
And when they begin to take those, all those lands for themselves, they were looking for ways to farm those lands in order to make more profits. They tried to work out those lands, but the lands were so vast. They tried to put in the indigenous Americans to work, but that did not work. And eventually, they saw that the Africans were relatively strong or stronger than others. And that Africans were relatively more, more or less immune to diseases which are wiping out the indigenous Americans, for example, smallpox, measles. And that Africans were already adapted to some agricultural techniques which are going to be useful. And that Africans were already dears for the taking. And that Africans were going to give them, give them free labor. That was how they chose Africans to be the slave that were going to work out the plantations in the Americas. So began this uh, trade in its worst form. From the years, from 1501, Spanish traders brought in the first wave of enslaved Africans to the Americas at the Hispaniola, present day the Dominican Republic and Haiti. Eventually, from the year 1545, the Portuguese traders began to make their entry into the transatlantic slave trade. And from the year 1562, the English people began to make their way into the transatlantic slave trade, with John Hawkins being the first Englishman to make entry into this trade. And it originally became the father of the triangular slave trade, which would make profits dropping slaves in Americas, then taking cotton, sugar, and so on to Europe, selling them in Europe. Then from Europe, they take clothes, take some materials, sell them in Africa. Collect people in Africa and throw them as slaves and sell them in the Americas. So it was called the triangular slave trade. So eventually the French, the Danish, and all those people made their way into this slave trade. Eventually, over 12 million Africans will be sold as slaves in the Americas. And over 3.5 million Africans are still buried at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean when we are being carried on our way to the slave plantations in the Americas. And eventually, over 10 million to even more than 50 million Africans will die in slave wars fought in order to capture Africans as slaves. And this would affect the population of Africa by over 2 billion persons. So this is how the slave trade began. And this is it. Thank you very much, sir. This is a huge insight. <laughs> okay. Without wasting much of our time, what is your take on the reparations for the transatlantic slave trade? Is it just? Must it be paid? Please speak on this topic. Our take as OAF on the reparations is that it has to be paid. We're taking it from the angle of justice, from the angle of repairing the damage done to the people of Africa, from the angle of restitution, from the angle of appeasement. We're talking about justice. Justice is to give to everyone what is due to him or to her. And paying Africans the labor, paying Africans the bill, the wage for the labor of Africans, which we carried out for over 400 years, is justice. Talking about repair, to repair a damage. The transatlantic slave trade damaged the continent of, of Africa for over 400 years. It caused poverty in Africa. If you talk about poverty in Africa, one of the reasons why there is poverty in Africa is because of the transatlantic slave trade. And this slave trade enriched Europe. Do you know that the transatlantic slave trade led to the Industrial Revolution? Yes, it did. It was through the Industrial Revolution, through the transatlantic slave trade, that the Industrial Revolution came to be. Because the Industrial Revolution began, according to BBC, in and around Manchester, because of proceeds from cotton. Because of cotton that was being shipped in from the uh, um, slave plantations, that was why there was need to process a lot of cotton. And from there, the Industrial Revolution began in Manchester. The Europeans made a lot of money. In fact, it was Africans that built the Americas, East, West, North, South, Central, everywhere. It was Africans that built the Americas. No, Africans built all these continents, yet Africa is poor. Because the transatlantic slave trade robbed Peter to pay Paul, he robbed Africa to pay the world. So, if you're talking about the wealth that the world is enjoying today because of the Industrial Revolution, you have to trace it to Africa. Therefore, Africans are supposed to be the richest people in the world. So, there has to be that justice, there has to be that reparation in order to make amend, in order to make Africa to be rich, in order to 
They have to even appease Africans who died during the transatlantic slave trade to appease present-day Africans because Africans are not happy that they were sold as slaves. And the descendants of the enslaved Africans are now living in poverty. The descendants are also living in prejudice, racism, which was caused by the transatlantic slave trade. So there has to be this, this payment of reparations. It has to be in cash and in kind. It has to be, they have to pay Africans for this transatlantic slave trade. Now check out. Other people of the world were paid when they were treated unjustly. For example, in the Holy Bible, the Israelites were in Egypt for 430 years according to the Bible. In the books of Exodus and the books of Genesis and Exodus. And that when the Israelis were living, or the children of Israel were living in Egypt, the children of Israel, God told Moses to tell the Israelites to meet the Egyptians and ask them for whatever they would want to have. And they asked the Egyptians to give them gold, to give them different articles. And the Egyptians gave them. And according to the Bible, they plundered the Egyptians. That was reparation. Also talk about after the First and Second World Wars, the Axis paid the reparations to the Allies. For example, after the First World War, which the Germans lost, the Treaty of Versailles, after the First World War, forced the Germans to pay reparations to France. And the reparation we're talking about amounts to about 102 billion marks, or present day about 270 billion dollars, which took the Germans over 70 years to pay up. That is reparation. Also, after the Second World War, Germany also was part of the Axis. Germany also lost the Second World War. And the Treaty of Paris forced the Germans to pay reparations to the Allies. Even after the war, Germany was partitioned into four. USSR took one, France took one, um, UK took one, and the US took one. Also, many industries in Germany were transferred to the Allies. Some railway stations, some railway lines were broken to pieces and shipped to the Allies. The USSR took parts of Eastern Germany, relocated 12 million Germans out of that uh, the portions, and took their own citizens and inherited as in those uh, inhabited those portions. That's part of reparation. Also, Germans have also paid the reparations worth over 100 billion dollars to, to the Jewish people. The Israelites used reparations that the Germans paid, paid them to solve to solve the water problem that they were facing because Israel is a desert. To talk about reparation, also reparations have been paid, even unjust reparations. The also reparations was paid to the Japanese Americans, which were interned during the Second World War, following the Pearl Harbor incident, in which the Japanese uh, uh, um, um, Air Force bombarded the Pearl Harbor that belonged to the U.S. Because of that, the U.S. took some Japanese Americans and put them in camps. The U.S. has paid over $1.2 billion to the Japanese Americans as reparations. Even unjust reparations have been paid. From the year 1825 to the year 1947, Haiti coughed out money worth over $21 billion to pay reparations to France because France colonized Haiti. That's unjust. The Lukobi bombing of 1988, Mugadha was forced to pay reparations worth over $2 billion to the victims of the bombing, or the victims, to the families of the victims of the bombing, even though Gaddafi was not proven to be the one behind the attack. If unjust reparations could be paid, why should it be difficult for reparations to be paid to the people of Africa? Why? So, we believe that reparation has to be paid. So, we believe that so long as reparations have been paid to other people who have been, who, who, who suffered similar damages, even less damages to what the people of Africa suffered, then our take is that the reparations for the people of Africa is guaranteed so long as we keep going for it. And because grace, we shall get it. Thank you very much. Wow. That's a lot of eye-opener. <laughs> so, with everything you have said, I want to know, why was Africa single-handed, handedly separated for this slave trade? Why is it that Africans, it seems as if Africans are singled out 
for this slave trade because over the years it's only african story about slave trade that have been had almost everywhere can you tell us why africans yes that's one of the questions that we need to also address because now first of all the transatlantic slave trade was not the first slave trade to occur in the world in the history of the world there have been several slave trades and even in the history of the world, slavery existed in every single culture and every single region of the world. It existed in Asia, it existed in Africa, it existed in the Americas, it existed in Israel, it existed in, in Japan, it existed in every single part of the world. But also, slave trades existed even before the transatlantic slave trade. For example, there was the Mongolian slave trade which occurred during the era of Genghis Khan. After Genghis Khan unified Mongolia in the year 1206 AD, and became the Genghis Khan. Initially, his name was Temujin. He began to conquer parts of Asia, parts of the world, parts of Europe, and then began began the the Mongolian slave trade. Then there was also the Roman slave trade during the Roman era. When Rome was ruling the world, there was the Roman slave trade, which also affected Africa. Now there was also the the Trans-Saharan slave trade or the Arab slave trade, which occurred in Africa and also affected Europe. And other also affected Asia. Before then, the transatlantic slave trade. The transatlantic slave trade was unique in that it was the only slave trade that focused on one continent and people, even though the volume was so large. Now, why did they focus on Africans? Like I mentioned earlier, the reason they focused on Africans was that first of all, they saw that the indig indigenous Americans could not fit in. They tried to put the indigenous Americans to work, but they were dying in thousands. Mesos was killing many indigenous Americans and they found out that the population of the indigenous Americans could not sustain the planting of or the cultivation of the, the, the Americas so they decided to choose Africans now they chose Africans because they found out that Africans were relatively stronger they found out that African man could walk under the sun several hours in a day and be strong enough to even walk the next day they found out that Africans were relatively immune to some of the diseases killing the indigenous Americans, especially smallpox. Why? Because Africans knew about smallpox, but the indigenous Americans didn't know about smallpox. In fact, it was an African, an African man by the name Onesimus, was the first person to prescribe vaccination against smallpox in the Americas. In the year 1721, when an outbreak of smallpox was ongoing in Boston, in the U.S., it was Onesimus, which was an African who was brought in as a slave from Africa. He told one of his masters that he should vaccinate against smallpox. And he told them that in Africa, what they would do is, when somebody has smallpox, we collect the person's the pores from the person that has smallpox and apply a little of it on somebody's injury, once you apply it on somebody's injury, the person will get a little bit of that smallpox. But that quantity will not allow the person to be overwhelmed by that smallpox. Instead, the person will develop the immunity against smallpox. And the person, eventually, if there's any smallpox outbreak, the person will not be affected. Then the master told a doctor. That doctor eventually began to talk about vaccination. People said Africans are demons, Africans are evil, Africans are wicked. Why would you be practicing something against God? Why would you vaccinate people against smallpox? Why would you apply smallpox against somebody that is not already having the disease? There was protests, there were riots, there was all kind of outrage against him. Eventually, he went on to vaccinate at least about 500 to 800 persons in the city. And when there was the outbreak, during that outbreak of smallpox, only very few persons who were vaccinated died. But those who were not vaccinated, a large portion of them, the percentage died. That was how smallpox came to be in Americas. Today, Onesimus is honored as one of the 100 most influential people to ever live in Boston and US. So you see that Africans knew about smallpox. So that was the reason, one of the reasons why Africans could survive. And the Europeans decided that Africans were good for this job. And also, they found out that Africans were already good in agriculture because Africans we are already farming, and Africans we are already good in some of the agricultural techniques that Europeans needed in order to cultivate the uh, Americas. And they found out that Africans were already there for the taking, because as we said earlier, the slave trade began 
in the year 1441. And then Columbus came into the America for the first time in 1492. So you can check the time difference over 50 years later. And eventually the slave trade into the Americans began about 100 years after the slave trade began in Africa, from Africa to Europe. You know, the slave trade began first of all from Africa to Europe, before from Africa to the Americas. And it was from 1545 when the Portuguese began to bring in their own wave of enslaved Africans and the slave trade began, the volume began to increase drastically. That forced the British people to make the entry, the French and also all these other people. So it was around 100 years gap before the volume of slaves being brought into the Americans increased drastically. So then they already knew about Africans, they knew the strength of the African man, and they knew that Africans were also going to offer free labor. Because if they wanted to take Europeans, they couldn't take Europeans because Europeans were going to fight them. To fight them. If the Spanish people decided to take Portuguese as slave to work in the Americas, there was going to be war between the Portuguese and the Americas and, and the Spain and, the, and, and Spain, which was going to be a bloody war. And they couldn't take the slaves from England. They couldn't take it, take them from France. If not, there could have been, if they had tried that, there could have been war in Europe. So they decided to go to a, an area where they could get people with less resistance. And they found out that then they had already conquered African kings, African people, and so on. So they could get slaves, they could get people from Africa easily. Because they had already gotten hold of Africa. So Africans were already there for the taking. All they needed to do was to put their ship, and then Africans would go in to Africa and bring in fellow Africans. And Africans were not doing that because they wanted to sell fellow Africans as slaves. They were doing that under duress, under conquest. Many African kings and queens resisted the slave trade, and the Europeans killed them, overpowered them, and subdued. So Africans had no choice than to begin to sell their fellow Africans as slaves. For example, the King Afonso of Congo, of a kingdom in then Congo, protested against the slave trade, who wrote protest letters to King Joe of Portugal, asking him to stop the depopulation of his kingdom via the Portuguese slave trade, all to no avail. His successor, King Gasha II, tried also, all to no avail. Queen Zenga Mbandi of a kingdom in present-day Angola, she fought and resisted the Portuguese several years, all to no avail. Agatha Trudor, king of Dahomey, fought the Portuguese, no way. Eventually, he saw that, that nothing could be done. His successors began to um, sell Africans as slaves. So, you see, so there are many things that contributed. One, they found out that the indigenous Americans were not strong enough to work. Two, the indigenous American population had already drastically reduced by over 90% from that 1492 to that 1545 or so. The indigenous American population must have dropped by over 95%. So, they had already drastically reduced the population in order to populate that area. Because what Europeans planned for the Americas was not direct or indirect colonialism. What they planned was settler colonialism. Settler colonialism is a form of colonialism, of colonization, where the colonizers come in to settle permanently on the colony. Not just to send a representative or to rule, no, but to settle just like what happened in South Africa and what happened in Zimbabwe. So, that was one of the reasons. Then, Africans knew how to keep themselves safe from those diseases. And Africans were already used to mosquito, malaria. So, Africans were not dying as much as the, um, the indigenous Americans. Africans were already there for the taking. They had already conquered West, the west coast of Africa. All they needed to do was just show up and collect people from Africa as slaves. And they also chose Africans because they knew that there was not going to be much war. And they knew that Africans were going to give them free labor, which is why we're not asking that they pay us for the free labor that we gave to them. Thank you very much. Well, that's a whole lot. <laughs> anyway, without wasting our time, there is another very important question. This one is not just any kind of question. It is the most important. The question here is, if this reparation must be given, what should it be? And to whom should it be given? Is there anybody that is holding Africans together? Can the reparations be given to them? Are they actually doing what we Africans want? 
or do you have any important opinion as to whom this reparation should be given and what exactly should be the reparation? Okay, thank you very much for that question. What should the reparations be? And to whom should do it go to? Now, in the year 1992, a group of respectable Africans under the, the name Eminent Persons came together, including former president-elect of Nigeria, Chief MKO Abiola, Ali Mazrui of Kenya, and Mira Makeba of South Africa, and began to press for reparations. They didn't give any price tag. Eventually, in the year 1999, a group under the name African World Reparations and Reparations Truth Com Commission said that the reparations should be at least 777 trillion US dollars, and they were going to put in all legal efforts and so on to get the reparations. Some have also asked for 12 trillion dollar reparations, and some have named different price tags for the reparations. Well, we in OF, we say it should, since the reparations should be looking into the four centuries, because the slave trade had occurred within four centuries, from the year 1441 and ended around 1900. So we're talking about four centuries here, roughly. So we should be talking about reparations to Africans per century. So per each century, we can look at $50 trillion reparations. Taking it like the African continent lost, let's say, $500 billion every single year for 100 years. So for those 400 years, we're talking about about $200 billion trillion loss. So we're talking about about $200 trillion reparations, $50 trillion for each century to pay to Africans. Now, how could the reparations be? The reparations could be in cash, should be in cash and in kind. It could be to support African projects. Now, some people will say that if we are to collect that am any amount in dollars, then what about inflation? For example, a trillion dollars in 2021 or 2022 would not be a trillion dollars made by the year 2050 because of inflation. And that is correct. So we could say 200 trillion dollars worth of reparations and it should be 2022 US trillion dollars. So if we're paying it in the year 2050, we have to check this one trillion dollars reparation paid in 2050. Is it worth two, is it worth a trillion dollars in 2022? If it's not, we scale it up or scale down in order to match what a trillion dollars was in 2022, something like that. And the reparations should come in cash and in kind. It could come in funding projects in Africa. For example, the Grand Engadam, which is being built in DRC in Congo today, is a dam that could solve power problem for remaining 40% of Africans who are without electricity. Bear in mind that over 600 million Africans are not connected to power grid till today. So funding that 75 to 85 billion dollar project should also count as part of the reparations payment. Building railways across Africa, building infrastructures across Africa could also be ways through which reparations could be paid. Transferring technologies to Africans, transferring warships to Africans, transferring aircraft carriers to Africans, transferring nuclear energy to Africans, transferring skills, opening up the doors for Africans to travel across the world, increasing Africa's share of, the tr of global trade, paying subsidies for African imports to Europe and to America, to Asia, those as into Asia, could be ways the reparations could be paid. And also honoring dead Africans, having holidays, global holidays for them, honoring our dead ancestors, these are ways we should pay the reparations. Having a day where the whole world observes a holiday to honor Africans who fell during the slave trade is also part of it. So these are ways in which reparations could be paid. And reparations to whom should it be paid to? It should be paid to the people of Africa, home and abroad. To Africans who are in the diaspora, who today are called African Americans, African um, Americans, and so on, in Brazil, especially Brazil, US, so in Europe, so should all be affected, should be will all receive this reparation. So also Africans who are in the African continent should also receive it. It should be like 50-50. Now, which organization should receive the reparations payment? The reparations should go to the African Union and to any organization that could receive it on behalf of African Americans or even direct payments. 
But we believe that before the reparations be received, there should be projects that the African Union, African government will use to carry out across Africa. And there must be a high level of accountability for what the money will be done with. And that is how we can then receive these reparations. The next question we have is, do you think that reparation is possible given the resistance of the Europeans? They have this opinion that slave trade is long gone. Africans were selling themselves, as in that's what they usually say. They say Africans were selling themselves. Do you buy this idea? Yes, there's always a resistance to things like this, you know? Coughing out trillions of dollars to pay as preparations is not something that's done so easily. For example, in that of the Bible, the Bible makes it clear that it was God that asked the Egyptians to give it, give the reparations to the Israelites through favor. He asked the Israelites to request, but God made it such a way that as they asked for it, the Egyptians gave it to them. So, if not, it could have been very difficult for that to happen. But that doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. In the case of Europeans, Americans, in the minifying indigenous people of Africa or in the minifying African Americans who suffered as a result of this slave trade, yes, there's bound to be arguments against reparations. For example, there is the argument that say that Africans were the ones going into inner Africa to bring in Africans to sell as slaves. Now, that argument is a deceptive argument. Now, let's talk about it. The people who began the slave trade the Portuguese, as I mentioned earlier, in the year 1441, it was Nuno and Anto Gonçalves that began the slave trade. They took 12 Africans from the um, Cape Branco in Mauritania and sold them as slaves in Lisbon in Portugal. So without that, there couldn't have been the slave trade. So that means this was a European affair in which they brought in Africans into it. So that cancels that argument in total. And Africans resisted the slave trade, like I mentioned earlier, at the Trudeau of Dahomey, the Queen Alfonso of Portugal, of King Alfonso of, of Kingdom in then Congo, when Zenga Mbandi, and many other people who fought against the slave trade. The African people resisted, and the Europeans overpowered them and institutionalized slave trade in Africa, making Africans to begin to sell their fellow Africans as slaves. So that was under duress. Even so, secondly, there's also an argument that slavery existed in Africa before then. As I mentioned earlier, slavery existed in different parts of the world. But Stalin coming to establish the transatlantic slave trade on the argument that slavery existed in Africa before, the answer is transatlantic slave trade didn't exist before the Europeans came. They are the ones who established that in Africa and began to sell Africans. And without that, it couldn't have existed. And they, they depopulated the African continent and they took a lot of wealth from Africa, which they have to pay us back. Thirdly, they said that Africans benefited from the slave trade. That what should we be talking about reparations? Now, let's talk about that. What did Africans benefit from the slave trade? Like I said, the Europeans benefited from the slave trade. They benefited from the slave trade through the Europeans benefiting the Industrial Revolution. They benefited the Industrial Revolution from the transatlantic slave trade. And the Americas were built through the slave trade. What did Africa benefit? Today, Africa is the poorest continent in the world. During the slave trade, Europeans were bringing one plate to collect 10 Africans. Is that trade an umbrella to collect 50 Africans? Is that trade a cannon gun to collect 200 Africans? What is the trade there? What is the profit there? So that means Africans did not benefit from the slave trade. It's just like going to buy a car. The Mercedes may batch 550, 2022 model. I am forcing someone to give you that car for $200. And you're saying it is trade. What I say, car that should be sold for about $200,000. For crying out loud, that is not trade. That is cheating. Pure cheating. And that is under duress. That is robbery. So that's what the transatlantic slave trade was to Africans. And so I also say that, like you said, that the descendants of the people who enslaved us are the ones who are alive and we shouldn't talk about reparations and that we were not the ones who were enslaved and the answer is this the present americans were not originally americans it shouldn't even be americans it was the ancestors who came into the americans 
and colonized the Americans. And till today, the present Americans, the white Americans, are enjoying the rule that they have over the American continents. Why don't they reject those continents? Because they are not the ones who colonized those continents. If they could accept American continents and call themselves Americans because of what their ancestors did, then they also have to pay reparations because of what the ancestors did against the Africans. If there's also a debt that our ancestors are owing, the Americans, we pay them. So why should they now not pay us a debt that the ancestors are owing us? And we, the present Africans, are suffering the effects of those slave trade negatively, just like the Europeans today are enjoying the effects of the slave trade positively. So that means they have every right to pay us reparations for the transatlantic slave trade. And there's no argument about that. There's also the argument that reparations have been paid already in the Obama presidency, in signing the civil rights law, and in the abolition of slave trade and slavery. Now let's talk about that. The Obama presidency was a triumph of popularity, not a reparation. The abolition of slave trade was an abolitionist movement, not a reparation movement. Now, the civil rights movement was an equalizing movement and not a reparation. If the Obama presidency was a reparation, then we want to talk about the 45 other US presidents, presidencies that, were, that are all whites. Are we going to call them reparations too? Now, if the civil rights law was a reparation, then what about white Americans who from one day never lost their rights? If the abolition of slave, of slave trade and the abolition of slavery was a reparation, then what about Europeans who were never slaves in the Americas? What do we call that? So it shows that the reparations have not been paid. For them to bring out those arguments means that they know that they owe us reparations and they are looking for a way to say that they have paid those reparations and they have not. Reparation has to be a material payment. It has to be tangible. What did we lose, lose? What do we lose during the slave trade? Pay it back to us. What do we lose during slavery? Pay it back to us. What do we lose during colonization? Pay it back to us. What have we lost so far under new colonialism? Pay back to us. That is what reparation is all about. So we believe that there's no argument against reparation anywhere. And we as OF, by God's grace, we are ready to defend the cause of reparation anywhere we are called upon. Because we know that it is a right cause which God himself has asked us to embark upon and by God's grace we shall get it. So there is no reason why that there will be no reparation. And we are calling upon the European Union, the African Union, calling upon the American US Congress and so on to join us together to make sure that there is a reparation paid to the people of Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chimere Ezemuzo, the leader of OAF, One African Family. We are happy to have you here at Afrimega Industries. You have done well. And so far, you have actually impacted us and our audience. At least, from now on, people will begin to think positively about transatlantic slave trade and its reparations. Thank you once again. And to you all Africans out there, we are happy to have you as our audience. As you have listened, we try to support the cause so that we can achieve a better Africa together. Thank you very much. Till next time.